great to be here. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to Phil Lisbon. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with Ilya today uh, to continue a conversation we started in Phil Austin about AI and crypto and so on. How are you doing, Ilya? I'm doing good. Yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Yeah, uh, great to have you. So let's dive into it. Like, um, you know, a lot of the people in the crypto community um, are not as familiar with AI and what's been going on and so on. Can you maybe describe like what's been happening over, over the last five years? Like, what's why is it suddenly exploding? For sure. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think it's suddenly exploding. To be clear. Yes. It's, it's been so. I, my machine learning started in not deep learning, and I've been doing it about 10 years. And so at some point, I saw like neural networks are starting to work. Like it was about, I don't know, 30, 40 years from the invention of them and like first examples to like, oh, actually, they starting to work and they start to produce some interesting results. And that was like 2012, 13. The, what happened then is that every time kind of there is a major improvement in a combination of hardware and models is when we're getting new capabilities. And so what happened in 2012, actually, Andrew Ng and Jeff Dean together put this gigantic GPU cluster and trained a model which was beating all the benchmarks on image recognition. And then kind of, you know, there's like multiple other milestones that happened through that, but then the other major one was uh, we had a work at Google where we released transformers, which have pretty much provided a like way cheaper kind of framework to build language and then image and everything else models. Uh, and so again, it was like a combination of models with a lot of hardware. And then OpenAI leveraging this model again through even more hardware and improved models as well got GPT-3 and then DALI and kind of and now stability has open sourced. And so I think like. It's this continuous spiral of like better hardware, adjusting models for that, and then kind of getting new capabilities that were impossible, like it was hard to imagine before. And so we're having the step functions. And so I think like GPT-3, DALI, and now Stable Diffusion are a example of this kind of latest step function. And the question is, are they accelerating? Because now it seems like we figured out the plan. It's like throw more compute, get more smarter researchers to look at it, and you know build bigger but more like smarter models, and then you know iterate on that. And so that's and that's where it gets like really interesting because already GPT-3 like stable diffusion they already capture a lot of the kind of what we call common sense. They still don't have reasoning yet, but they already have common sense and a lot of knowledge that you know you would usually imagine like humans have. And it seems to me that you know transformers uh, were this important model and architecture shift that enabled a lot of. Um, applications to happen with either smaller models or, or in general, just qualitative improvements. Um, and it's been really surprising how well they apply across a variety of domains. Um, you know, as a, one of the people that helped uh, that build these, uh, do you see, do you think like we need many more architectural improvements like that? Or do you think like the, the architectural improvements that we have so far are just gonna be able to solve like dramatically more complex problems? Um, I mean, it's been very surprising to see the last few years uh, of results. Um, do you think that this gets us to like full human capable uh, reasoning, or do you think there are some there are like bigger um, bigger leaps that we have to make there in terms of architecture? So, I mean, it's always hard to like when you're working on this, it doesn't feel like you're making any big leaps. Like to be clear, like going from you know like long-term short memory, which we're using for question answering, to a transformer, it didn't feel like completely, you know, you're reinventing something. It's just like then it worked really well. And so I think we'll have a few more things like that. Somebody will be like, well, why don't we do this? And it's like, oh, actually, like, if you structure it this way and scale it up, it becomes like completely different capability. So I, I do expect that to happen, but it will not be because, like, oh, we need a fundamentally, you know, like, rethink everything. It will be more of like, hey, I'm doing this. I need, you know, for example, I do think we need a memory bank that's like more actively managed uh, for these models because right now all the memory is in, in the parameters. And so like that will be a thing that, you know, somebody will figure out how to make it work and then like everybody will just use that. It'll become standard. Yep. And and um, we, in this time period, we've also seen kind of an explosion in, in research in a lot of groups uh, around the world. Uh, can you maybe speak to like some of the um, 
the, the distribution of R&D that's going on in the world, do you see this sort of accelerating? Um, is it accelerating everywhere, or is it uneven, or like sort of like what's happening to the community? Yeah, so it's very uneven, right? I think, and this is where the kind of one of the core problem is the right now to if you want to kind of train one of these models, right? And we're talking about like you know 30 billion parameters in the minimum, and like right now I think there's a model released yesterday of 500 billion. So you need a cluster of a GPUs, which are specific GPUs, A100s, and you need a thousand of them for a 30 billion parameter. So that's so a A100 costs thirty thousand dollars, and you need a thousand of them. That's thirty million dollars cluster. If you want to train a bigger model, you need ten thousand of them. So that's you know three hundred million dollars. So that is pretty much a you know if you want to play this game, if you want to train this like low level models, you need to put out that to to get the cluster to start training, and that's very small number of you know organizations are able to do it, and there's almost no universities or like kind of you know public goods organization that able to do that. I think there's none, actually, at this point. So right now, it's mostly Google. OpenAI is Microsoft. There's you know, probably some, something is built in China. And then like maybe a few other organizations that are like kind of in the lagging of this. But uh, that's currently a very, I would say, limiting factor to you know, all of the researchers who are right now in universities, for example, literally have no access. Like, the papers they write are about using GPT-3 API yep. and see what they can do, not building these models or, or training them. Yeah, yeah and this, is, this hyper-centralization is pretty dangerous from a lot of perspectives. Like, one part is um, just that means a very few number of companies uh, have access to this kind of extremely powerful set of technologies that are going to be able to um, uh, do lots of you know, in tremendously powerful things in the internet over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and so access to that is you know, highly limited. Uh, so this is maybe something somewhere where blockchains could help. Let's get into that in a moment. But like, if we were to build a decentralized compute cloud for, for AI, um, we need more than the GPUs. So the GPUs are one piece, and that's you know, 30 million. Uh, we heard $30 million just, just for the GPUs. You also have to organize those GPUs uh, in close proximity to each other. They have to have very low latency. They have to be run a particular way, and so on. So we're talking about like, massive deployments, like data center level deployments. Um, if you were to sort of like, I don't know, like, organize that kind of computation to emerge in these networks, um, what are the kinds of things that you would, you would want these data centers to have? Because uh, my guess is we'll see some of these compute networks emerge over the next year or two. Um, and so maybe if you like, break down, like, what are the characteristics that you need? So you need GPUs. You need like, low bandwidth connectivity. What, what else? Yeah, so the bandwidth connectivity right now, if it's only 100 gigabit per second, that's not enough. Yep. So right now, it's 400 gigabit per second interconnect. And you usually like, link them up in kind of this torus kind of uh, shapes. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very like, s specific setup. So there's a lot of people trying to build custom hardware for those things, right? I mean, Google has TPUs. Tesla is building their own version for different use case. And so there's like, a lot of experiments in this. And I think where blockchain and like, we've seen come in is where if you set up the problem right way, you can actually incentivize people to figure out a the most energy efficient solution, right? The most cost efficient solution to to uh, you know solve this problem. Right? I think like Bitcoin miners is probably the most optimized way to compute the SHA-256, right? On that specific bytes that you can have. And so the question pretty much here, and and why it's challenging is because the models continue innovating, and so the specific shape of the problem continues changing, and specifically the ways you paralyze. Like there's, for example, a mixture of experts idea that came in a bit later after transformers, but you know a lot like it scales up the model, but it makes it you know sparser. So you need like to paralyze things very differently, and you activate different parts of the GPUs pretty much in your compute cluster differently, and so that kind of stuff is always like hard to do mechanism design for. Yeah, yeah and it, um, especially because as the model, as the structures change, you end up needing to reconfigure the hardware and the, and the way the hardware is connected and the software that, that runs it. And so today, like the, the large centralized cloud companies can, can do that because they have pretty sophisticated data centers. Um, and so we, if we want decentralized networks to, to be able to compete, then we're, we're going to need to be 
able to have that, that degree of um, you know, amount of hardware and connectivity in one place, but also the ability to reconfigure it on, as the advances change, as the models change, and, and so on. Um, and if you were to sort of like design the incentives that causes this kind of network to emerge, like in the Falcon network, we've had a lot of success with um, just talking about adding capacity and then also bringing significant useful storage into the network, and that has scaled out, you know, 16 exabytes of capacity is an enormous amount. We're at, o at about like almost 250 petabytes of data, but getting to that different type of upgrading, um, that's a much harder challenge. And so w what would be the sort of like, what do you think is like the, sm the, the smallest reasonable cluster size where you could say, okay, great, like now we, we're in business, we could have something, um, we can start training models like this. Like, would you imagine kind of like five um, deployments, each of which, you know, is like a 30 to $50 million investment in terms of GPUs and so on? Or do you think more is needed? Do you think like we need to scale out to like have a larger network than that or, or each deployment being larger? I think starting with like yeah, each deployment being around thirty million dollars worth of like hardware is probably a good start, and having like few of them so you have redundancy, but you also have like you know more capacity for more people to do it. And I think the question here will be the people who actually can use this, they have no money, right? So like they they you need to borrow the value from the future in a way to give them this capacity and availability. And I think that's that's where yeah, like mechanism design becomes extremely important. It's like how do we how do we give a researcher, you know, who is sitting in like MIT even, like MIT has no funds to do this, like which is yep. insane, right? If you think of it, like th their their endowment has money, but then like their computer science department cannot allocate that. Um, so, like, how do we get that to to a level where like they are able to, you know, apply pretty much, like, I mean, similar, like, apply for a contract saying like this is what we want to do. We need this much com compute and capacity for this amount of time, and that then, uh, you know, gets like executed and then proven that this, but then it becomes potentially a public good that everybody else can build on top. Yeah. And we might also see some hardware being developed in this community too. I mean, uh, the very famously, all of the Bitcoin hardware got super optimized and, and fleshed out. Nowadays, we're seeing zero knowledge hardware and, and other types of hardware coming in. Do you think that if we create these networks, we, we can get you know, things like TPUs and, and kind of like Tesla's dojo style um, petascale compute systems being built by the crypto community? I think so. I think especially if we combine it with the models, so it's like where, where incentive is actually like model to compute kind of pairing. And so if that happens, then like people will design models and compute almost like in, you know, in, in, in the conjunction. And that will then in turn like kind of provide better compute, but also like the models will be designed for that. And so I think kind of incentivizing that pair is important. Yeah, so let's get into some of the benefits and risks of decentralized AI compute clouds. Um, let's go with, start with the benefits first. Like, what do you, what do you think? So we touched on centralization of access. We touched on maybe finding ways of raising public goods oriented funding for groups to do R&D. What are some of the other benefits that you see um, uh, critically here where decentralized AI compute could be drastically better for the world than, than centralized? Well, I think that, I mean, the biggest thing is, is access, right? I mean, like, the researchers is more of an input. It's like now you have all those researchers, more minds, you know, more diverse kind of uh, ideas coming in means we can go faster and we can try more things, we can actually uh, innovate. But the output of this is really this models are being able to use across kind of wide spectrum. And I think this is where stability have shown, like, even if you don't, like, they did not give you the access, they just give you the model. But having the full model available already opened up like an insane experimentation field, right? People are like, oh, we can actually distill it and put it on a phone. We can, you know, do videos with it. We can do this, like, and so they just the uh, it opens up the application level innovation, which, you know, not always like when researchers are working on it are thinking, but but just like these capabilities now are so kind of unique and strong that they you know can change like how we experience web, how we experience you know entertainment and content, like everything, uh, kind of how world is organized in a way, right? And so I think that's that's a truly the benefits, which is like if it's just served to you via API or you know through like Google search bar, like it is powerful, but it's not. It's not opening up this kind of 
kind of composable yeah. uh, innovation that we and we see that in blockchain as like an example of it. Yeah. What about governance? Do you think that blockchains could be helpful in governing these models better? Yeah. So I, I do think like pretty much blockchain is the governance framework, right? I think like in, in a way like what blockchains are a coordination system. The money is just a tool to do coordination, right? But at the end, it's coordination and the Training AI, but then also using AI will be a coordination problem. It will be like, okay, well, now that we have this super powerful, you know, potentially God, how do we make sure that it's, you know, actually working for everybody's good? And, and like, what does that even mean, right? Because everybody has very different uh, views on what's good and what's bad. People have a very different sense of like what, how the world should evolve, right? And so figuring out how to coordinate that, how to come to a consensus, how to find the kind of balance of different stakeholders. This, I mean, this is what we're trying to do with blockchains and with governance. So I think that that's probably the most important primitive. And like, I think of governance kind of as a <laughs> side note, right? Like governance, you know, especially if you look at any government right now, they are built like everything you, you can see is built because of the technology, information propagation, and some of the culture and like historic context, you can actually literally infer the government they built, right? Like, you know, things like transportation costs and, you know, how long it takes for information. It's like, oh, you would need to send representatives to vote on the president because they didn't have a way in, in 1700s to actually do the collected votes, yeah. right? Now we have collected votes, so new governments are able actually to have a rep, like full representative government. And so with blockchain, we have a completely new way of information propagation, of coordination, of making decisions, and so the governance, th this is the place where we can innovate on governance. And we can actually like fork it and change it and iterate way faster than you can do with you know, a country gov government or like a local government. And so I think we are in a unique position to figure out kind of next step for like human coordination. And so, and like, you know, there's a lot of experiments doing this now, which is really exciting. And so applying that to AI will be extremely important because otherwise, yeah, we'll, ha we'll have like a, Kind of a you know run on the on the craziness. And if you think about um, suppose that we have built out this larger scale decentralized network. Suppose that the governance is better than say centralized groups. What does that look like practically? Like um, when you submit some some prompt and so, some query or some request to a model like this, uh, what are the kinds of like how, how should we process that? How should we decide what is good to run that will be kind of in? How do we kind of value align? Humanity itself, like we certainly blockchains can give us the mechanisms to do it, but like how do we a, a arrive at that alignment? Yeah, so I mean, actually, like that is already done by um, by you know those groups which are giving you API. They are uh, fine tuning the models on specific data sets to pretty much make them less evil, <laughs> like pretty much debias it, right? Like you know, yep. internet is shit to be clear, and, and so these models are trained on a lot of shit, and so like you need to debias the models to like promote you know, that, like inform, information rich content and not like kind of general bad stuff. And so, so I think the idea here will be to curate registries of, you know, what's kind of positive and, and, and negative examples, let's just say, right? So like, you know, things that should not be promoted, things that should not be kind of uh, in, in the model's output, and so curate that list through this governance. So it's not going to be like every prompt, you know, you have the thing. It's more like as there is a pattern that, you know, a community agrees as a whole that should not be like surfaced. Like how do we kind of train the model to not showcase that? And so like there's already methods to do that. We just don't have the curation mechanism. Right now it's, you know, people at one of those organizations individually deciding like, oh, we're going to add some stuff to this model. Uh, could, could this kind of um, structure help with just uh, AI risk, like AGI risk? I, I mean, I think it's definitely in the direction. I think we'll, we probably will need more research on how to truly kind of direct these models in general, right? Like, it's probably not just fine tuning. It's maybe like a, you know, like one of the one of the kind of research right now in, in, in psychology actually around consciousness is that you have pretty much like your subconscious kind of generate stuff and then you have the conscious is more of a discriminator which kind of like both tries to like filter that and then tries to explain it to itself like why did you come up with that. 
And so like, if you think of that model, you can kind of have a similar model where you have a discriminator which you know, is trained to be like, you know, focus on humans, focus on, like, you know, use the three laws of Isaac Asimov, for example, and uh, like, they kind of, you know, evaluate the output of the main model as a, like, is it fits into this, into this system. So I think that, that types of systems probably will emerge in, in, in this structure, and then, as I said, like, you, right now it's fine tuning, that's very, like, coarse, right, and you can still kind of get some really bad stuff out of it if you know what you're doing. And so, like, if you have kind of another model that really is a critic, uh, it may become kind of a way to do it. Um, so now that we've covered a bunch of the benefits, let's talk about the risks of decentralized AI systems. What are, what is the potential, what are the dangers that we should be avoiding and building against, right? So um, there are many naive ways of deploying these things that could be pretty dangerous. Let's kind of like unpack that a bit. Like what, what should we be avoiding? Well, I think the biggest risk, right, is that when it is public, right, now everybody has access to it. And so if, if it's really easy to get a hold of the whole model and then, you know, clone it, then any malicious actor can then start using it kind of outside of whatever protections and community governance you're trying to build. And that's probably the kind of biggest risk and, like, how do you, how do you protect against that is, is quite complicated, right? And I don't think we still have we yet to have like tools to do that well, right? I mean, like zero knowledge is way too expensive and like literally not usable for AI. I mean, there's like a small field of ZK ML that's emerging, but like the just compute costs are insane, right? Even like SGX, which a lot of people were hoping would work, like the reality is you need this like massive compute. So like you, SGX is like a single pass on a CPU, right? So you just cannot use that. And so, I think that's where like one of the bigger problems like are we you know replicating the like in such a way that nobody can restore like do we use homographic things do we like use uh, machine learning tools to do replication in such a way that like none of the single observer can able to fetch it like how do we how do we kind of incentivize and also somebody can go and bribe everyone in this network right to just get all the data so uh, so I think that's that's a really interesting question uh, and I think there's also blockchain can be a solution to some of this because the risks in general, not just of, of uh, decentralized AI, is, is like a lot of fake content, right? Like that's one way or another, fake content, manipulation, like easier way to like what, you know, what some people already done on social networks, but like running fully automatically, right? The bots on Twitter becoming like way more intelligent and actually like, but, incentiv but incentivized to like convert you into like a phishing attack or scam or whatever. And so I think that's, that's a part where like we can actually start protecting using blockchain because blockchain is also your authentication layer. It's your way to like ensure that the content is, has a provenance and has, you know, somebody signed it when they sent it and it came from the right people, right? And so, and from right communities and, you know, you can have then like different levels of, of uh, curation that different people like, oh, this is the people I know, so look at this content, oh, okay, this has been curated by somebody else I know and so you can have like curation networks. And so I think the, kind of Web3 is also a tool in general. Like I, I call it, you know, AI, AI will bring us a post-scarcity world, right? Like presumably when we have, you know, kind of a very intelligent machines, we will not have natural scarcity. I mean, there may be some, you know, natural resources, but, um, and so what we need is back, we're going to need to go back to actually some artificial scarcity and blockchain actually brings you back artificial scarcity, right? So like, how do we actually like ensure that there is there is scarcity of identity, there is scarcity of content, there is scarcity of communication? What sort of limitations do you think will be important early on? Because it seems to me that taking one of the latest large language models and just giving people um, just broad access to input whatever prompt, especially if that thing is coupled to be able to issue its own transactions into blockchains or send email or whatever. Like that to me seems like super dangerous. How can we create a, a good, safe structure so that you know, we, we can get like a lot of the good without the bad? So like how, how would we kind of like screen the inputs, screen the requests, or screen the outputs to like decide like, oh yeah, this seems like a good set of actions that, that the world wants? But 
I, I don't think we can. I, I think like we, we cannot like say, oh, the model should not do this. Like that that like somebody will figure out how to do it. Like if, even if even if you know like a large part of the world agrees, it's enough to have one actor who has enough cap capabilities to build that to build a thing that will not agree. And so I think that's where like you know if you're talking about emails, transactions, etc., this is where we need prominence. Like the fact that right now emails are not signed, cryptographically signed, and they, there's no like provenance on who you are is insane. To be yeah, clear, like totally. even at this moment, totally without AI. So I think like actually getting to a world where you know the Twitter should be signed, the you know the kind of all of the things should be like actually like with provenance and with with uh, with a ways to like authenticate and authorize. And same with like if we're talking about you know taking photos and and kind of creating content, like all that should have a way to authorize and also to a way to challenge it. There should be a way to say like, hey, this is fake news that doesn't represent facts. Here is a thing and like, you know, how do we surface that information then to the consumer as well? So I think that like we kind of need to solve that problem, honestly, even without AI. AI will just make this problem so, so, so much like more emerging right now because like you can literally right now see full Twitter with fake content from GPT-3. Like it, and it will look like it's kind of people are talking. Like this is possible right now. And will, nobody will be able to like this, I mean, especially on Twitter, like <laughs> most of the Twitter tweets are, it looks like they're generated. Yep. So we'll be opening up for questions from the audience in a moment. Uh, there are two mics here in front, so feel free to uh, stand up and start making uh, some lines here. Um, I'll just ask two more questions we, before we go to go to your, yours. Um, so number and um, if people, if there's a live stream and people ask questions, just do ask your questions with, with a hashtag Phil Lisbon, and I'll I'll check Twitter and, and see if there are any there. Uh, so one question: What can the Falcon community uh, do to help Near or to help this um, decentralized AI uh, trajectory? So I think there's so kind of the you know AI is is three pillars, right? It's the data model and the compute. And so I think on the data side, it's pretty clear what to do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just uh, generate more data, high quality data. There's also crowdsourcing and things like that. Like Near has Near Crowd, for example, for crowdsourcing. Like plugging in with that can be really interesting. Models. Uh, I, I mean, I, this is more of a research and kind of uh, integration, but obviously, like Falcon community is huge, right? So kind of propagating that and getting people excited about this. And then compute, I think this is where like mechanism design and I know like, I mean, obviously the Falcon nodes have a lot of GPUs already. So like thinking through how can this be leveraged uh, to build this new new mechanics, right? I think is really interesting. And, and I'm sure like as, as that matures, there will be really a lot of kind of collaboration there. Yeah. Sounds great. Uh, let's do it. And um, can you paint your optimistic vision for the future? Say, like, you know, 20 years out, um, what do you, what do you kind of like dream about, and what what, are, what is like the future that you and uh, um, you're fighting for? So for me, kind of, it's it's about on one side, you know, why why I'm in blockchain is to give the control to the user, right? So that's that's the main kind of driver on one side. And so with that, like giving the control of, you know, having a personalized intelligence, intelligent machine, right? Now, like, I don't like AGI because it's like people think, oh, maybe it will be its own sentient being. It's like, well, as humans, we actually don't want another sentient being. We just want a really smart assistant, right? And so I think like kind of every human having like all of their data, all of their uh, kind of things they, they care about, and then having this uh, kind of intelligence as well as part of their toolbox. And then what that enables is everything from, you know, accelerating research, right? Now, like, there's so many papers coming out every day. Like, you can literally get, like, a summary of all of that in, in your, you know, in your messenger as, as you go for coffee, right? It's, you know, understanding what you want and like generating content for you. And, and it's really interesting because I think the entertainment will change because like you can already imagine a like, you know, let's say TikTok feed that's fully generated. Like that's literally just generated for you based on what you like, right? 
And so like things like that, I think, will change and shift how, how we as humans kind of interact with the world. And so I think the other part that's important is still continue like figuring out how we socialize and how we connect to each other. Because if we all have like this kind of our own bubbles, it will be really hard to go out them. So I think like balancing, balancing act of these things is really important. And so like I think it's, it's really like advances in science. It's this idea that you are kind of, you know, as powerful as you can be, pretty much as smart as like smarter than any human on, in any field using these tools, and then at the same time, like you know, being able to connect with everyone and be able to you know be social and kind of interactive. So, great. Um, thanks. All right. So I think first question was over here. I think there was somebody. Or here. Let's let's take this one over here. And please say your name uh, and then your question. Hi, my name is Sergey. Um, Ilya, Juan, thank you for the great discussion. Extremely interesting. Uh, so what advantages do you see of decentralized system to solve this problem versus centralized? For example, AWS builds infrastructure and allows to borrow you know, compute uh, from them, for example. So I think the reality will be that it will be AWS and others who will build it. I think that the problem right now is that when they build it, they only give it access to a single company, right? They don't have motivation right now to give access. Like, there's no counterweight for them to like, oh, the you know we should open it up. It's right now like, you know, kind of the incentives are around like, okay, well we'll have one client. One client will give us fifty million dollars, and we'll build a cluster for them. So I think the like it's the same reason for you know Bitcoin miners. There's actually like what four major miners that mine like you know whatever seven six now because the the bear market ended up like yeah, yeah. It, but but but, yeah, like, but like you know overall like it's you know th there will be major players who will do most of the work and that's normal um, but the fact that you have an ability to kind of come in into the system and kind of open it up is is contrabalance right it's it's like it was any competition if you don't have any competition then you you become a monopoly and you you know, you, you change how you do things versus if there is competition, like similar for NVIDIA. NVIDIA is charging $30,000 for this piece of hardware. Like, does it really cost $30,000 to produce? Maybe not. And so you could actually enforce um, with decentralized networks, you could actually enforce that the models and the compute is happening in different regions of the world. So you could get into um, jurisdictional uh, independence here by forcing a lot of the uh, AI clouds to be located in different jurisdictions. So. so, so we think it will drive competition, and competition will drive the cost down. Basically, it yeah, I mean, it's like making more available, cost less, and and kind of you know keep everybody on their toes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. My name is John Sykerwijk, and I wanted to thank you guys for um, igniting the imagination again on this subject. That uh, you've you've touched a whole bunch of points that. Uh, I had never thought about till just a couple minutes ago, and I wanted to bounce a couple ideas off and see if it resonates, see if I uh, fully understand it. It, <clears throat> it sounds like you're talking about the, actually the democratization of AI, and if we think about IPFS and all the public data that's out there, the quality of any AI system is based upon the quality of data that goes into it, the quantity of data, and the questions that are asked of the data. And it sounds like we've got a unique opportunity here to take data of opportunity that exists within IPFS and apply that with questions that if we think about how we verify statistics and looking at the right, uh, the same sets of data, two research and uh, two statisticians can look at the same data based on the questions that they're motivated to answer, but we can do this at the inference engine level and ask questions of these data sets so using AI as a, as a sixth sense on large things, it sounds like what you're describing is a true opportunity to, to democratize the sixth sense of large data perceptions by being able to have composable infrastructure out there that can parse public data for ferret out nuggets of wisdom, of insight, of trend lines, of behaviors. And uh, rather than having to worry about locking it up behind a silo that exists in a uh, public cloud by a public company or, or whatnot, we can democratize this. And I'm wondering if that idea resonates with, with what you've been saying. Uh, issues aside that we talked about with apprehension, this sounds like a real golden opportunity to, to democratize this for all of society, and it sounds wonderful. 
Yeah, I mean, in general, that's what I was saying. Like, if you look out in the future, my expectation is that you don't really need to kind of manually go through, you know, through news, through articles, through, you know, research papers, through data itself. It will be kind of, you know, you'll have the instrument to summarize all that into kind of your key points that you care about for specifically for you from all this and like in not just public but also your private data as well and and so kind of some of the things are already happening right now like it's not it's not even like it's not science fiction it's like you can actually ask some of these models to summarize news right now you can you know the people are training models that are actually can take unstructured well like structured but like in completely random format data, right? Let's say medical data, and then restructure it and be able to answer questions to it kind of in a very specific, you know, the predetermined formats, like completely autonomously. And so like this kind of stuff is happening right now. Like, you know, there's like few startups I know that are doing this kind of stuff. So generally like it is happening and it's just gonna kind of accelerate from this because the capabilities of this models show, as I said, is like Reasoning is not yet, but this is what everybody's working on. And but the common sense is already there, and so ability to remap data, which is common sense, is already happening. And now people are training how to do reasoning and how to do inference and how to do kind of logical, you know, multiple steps and being able to explain why is this, uh, you know, why is this answer happened? Like, what are the reasons for it? And actually, like, there's a model that was published yesterday from Google, which. Like literally they trained it to explain itself. Like that was the kind of explain itself, then gives the answer. And so that already, it's pretty amazing that that result that, that yields so much better results. Yeah. yeah. Which but like if you think of it, it makes sense because yeah. like you 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 want the model to like actually think through what it does versus just try to hallucinate some answer. And so I think that we're starting to see this really amazing things that will will be changing how you interact with with information. Over here. Um, thanks for organizing and uh, starting and opening this conversation. Um, my question might be a hard one to answer, but if we want to decentralize this type of compute, like long running, quite intensive compute, um, to be, I mean, we, we have three methods replication, challenge verification, or proof technologies. Do you have some visibility on how you would pull these? compute clouds accountable for the output they do, either on inference or learning? Um, thanks. Yeah, that's probably the hardest question. <laughs> um, I think right now, right now, the way to do it is, is, is to figure out kind of if you train it on one of this, like how to uh, how to evaluate the quality that's kind of independent of the training. So like I would not expect that we will be able to train in a like in truly decentralized way just yet. So like it will be more of you know multiple centralized clusters that you can kind of leverage and then being able to evaluate the quality. And I think like because it will be centralized, it will be more accountable than you know like it will not be just you know somebody permissionlessly spinning up a machine. It will be like somewhat known entities. So I think that at this point we're here. Over time, there might be ways to figure out how to how to scale training and industrialization that doesn't require this like tight internet connectivity. But we're not there yet. I, th I think there is a, a lot of potential in using crypto structures to make sure it's like the right inputs and the right outputs are being. Uh, so for whom? Um, cool. I don't know why. Maybe it was this mic. Um, so it could be. Uh, we, we could be using some of the crypto um, constructions to be able to tell that the right prompts and the right inputs and the right outputs are, are, are being generated and then create hardware that checks for that provenance of the, of the inputs and so on to, to sort of end up with a much safer um, structure to invoking and using compute um, AI systems. Uh, any other questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Gustavo. And uh, two years ago, when we have the ICO, was a boom of ICOs. And now in crypto space, two years, a long time. And uh, I'm still wondering, what are the risks that Filecoin can be considered a security? And what has been doing 
to Sorry, this this is a panel about AI systems, uh, so this is not the not the right place for a question like that. And this question has been asked by, uh, many times. So you can look up the answer online. Thank you. Any other questions? You talked about compute a lot, but one other topic on con convergence of AI and blockchain that interests me is how blockchain data, like public data that is available on blockchains, um, opens new capabilities as well for the AI. Because a lot of that information is currently closed within companies, corporations, and so on. But now we switch to a lot of decentralized applications where you can map wallet activity on different chains and so on. Um, what's in your opinion? Um, yeah changes it, it could be. Yeah, so I have a, actually a very specific example. So let's say you go to Twitter and you see your feed and you have no idea why the hell it's at that feed and not any different feed, right? And so you complain about it on Twitter um, and nothing changes, right? So imagine that Twitter was on an open platform, so maybe it used some, you know, maybe de decentralized storage protocol, some, you know, a decentralized identity, and you can actually pick which ranking system you want to use because they all will be indexing and, and training on the same data, but they can t be tuned for different results, right? Different users may want different ranking based on their preference. And so you can literally just, in your app config, select what, like, you know, somebody's like, oh, I found really cool ranker. You can pick it from here. It's like you just, you know, plug it in and start using. So kind of generally the idea is like now, we can move away from like the recommendations, the uh, you know kind of what what you see and what like because all of that like every single thing you see actually on your screen in a phone is running through a machine learning right now, mm -hmm. and so like all of that can be now in your control, and it's because like if at least it's public data, you the models can be trained, kind of anybody can train them and then give you access to this. And then you can also then, you know, use federated learning for private data and kind of, uh, and, and run it on edge. And so we're not there yet, but like, because we don't have actually any social networks or any of, of these apps to be in public domain. But, you know, there's a lot of folks are working on that specific problem. Like, how do we bring it? And now we'll be able to do this. But like, the simplest thing that's doable right now, which I like, if anybody's interested in, in, in machine learning, is just like train a model that predicts next transaction. Very simple, but it's a very powerful thing that you can then actually plug in into any wallet, into any app, like to specialize, like to suggest people what to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe a related questions. Like you mentioned kind of positive changes, but is there any evil maybe related to ads, advertisers, because they're getting more public data about people? Um, yeah, is it good or bad? From like marketing, advertising perspective? Well, so, I mean, that's where the other side of blockchain comes in, is like you kind of control the view, right? You decide which front end to use. Like the idea that you need to go to this website is not true in blockchain. You can go to any portal that shows it, and maybe it shows you ads, maybe it doesn't. It's your choice now. And so maybe it shows you ads and pays you, or maybe it shows you ads and pays for your transactions, or maybe you pay and then it doesn't show you ads. So now, the question is like, is it good that the, the portal that shows you ads and pays you or, or being able, like for example, like Brave, is it good that they get any more data? And you know, that might be a good, uh, good idea. And, but then on the other side, we obviously need more privacy tech. So I don't, think, I, I don't think anybody will say we need less privacy. It's for sure true that we need to you know, shield a lot more stuff than it's right now on blockchain. Awesome, thanks so, a lot. It, oh. There's also good news in terms of the acceleration of hardware over the next you know, five, 10 years and fully homomorphic encryption. Um, I would expect a lot of really important computation that today is extremely dangerous in terms of a privacy standpoint um, to be run in either zero knowledge or fully homomorphic encryption in the next 10 years. So I think you know, five to six years from now, we'll start to see first scalable FHE applications and then you know 
10 years to 15 years from now, I think we can start seeing those deployed at large scale to handle you know, social network data and things like that. So I, I think that there's significant hope that um, email and messaging and, and social networks and you know, the, the things that generate the most, say, socially dangerous information um, can be run in, in these kinds of systems. Now, that'll be hard to couple with the AI models unless we also see a corresponding improvement in, in, in the models themselves and in mixing those kinds of applications with the, with the models. Thank you. Cool. Well, um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being with us and continuing the conversation. I think we'll see a lot of important improvements on this over um, next year and in the year after that. And so I think um, we'll see large-scale decentralized compute networks for AI coming online sometime next year or the year after, and then a bunch of applications. So hopefully we can um, achieve all of the benefits that, that you talked about and uh, get prevent a bunch of the risks. So yeah, thank you very much. For sure, yeah. Thanks for inviting. Thanks.